Now the smallest of the blood vessels are the capillaries. And I've just sketched out a network of capillaries here. So the blood is going to come into the capillary network via this arterial here. So this is an arterial. And the arterial, of course, is bringing blood from the heart. So that's from the heart. So the arterial system is perfusing this arterial. We have an arterial. Now this larger arterial is going to give rise to smaller arterioles. And this smaller arterial here, this vessel here, is a met arterial. The met arterial. So we see the met arterial going down here. And these are the capillary loops that are branching off from this met arterial. Ultimately, when the blood has gone through the capillaries and down through the met arterial, it's going to be collected into the venous system. So what we have here is one of the small veins. This is a venule. one of the small veins, and this is going to be draining the blood back to the heart. So that is the direction of blood flow. Now the musculature here is quite important because the smooth muscle it doesn't go all the way around normally, there's like bands of smooth muscle, so it's a bit like if that's the uh, small vessel there, there's bands of muscle like my fingers going round about the, uh, the vessel like this. And it's the same in the meta arterial. There's bands of muscle. And these are important because they can contract and they can relax. This is uh, important processes. There's vasodilation. Vasoconstriction. So vasodilation is when they dilate vasoconstriction, the muscles will contract and the vessels will therefore get smaller as they close the vessels off. And also at the start of the, at the uh, arterial end here, we have sphincters regulating the passage of blood. Again, these sphincters can constrict or dilate. And because these sphincters are before the capillaries, they're called precapillary sphincters. S P H I N C. Precapillary sphincters. Again, controlling the amount of blood that flows through the capillaries. So these capillaries are actually very narrow vessels. The walls are only one cell thick. So if you look at the capillary walls, which we'll do so later on in more detail, but we see that the cells are only, the walls are only one cell thick. So here we have the individual vascular endothelial cells that make up the wall of the uh, capillary. We notice that they all have their own individual nucleus. That's all a capillary is, it's this tube of cells made up of individual vascular endothelial cells. So these are endothelial. 
cells and of course they're vascular because they're part of the vascular system there's a there's a basement membrane around about the outside of the capillary but that's it it's just a tube to let the blood go through narrow tube five to ten micrometers in diameter so about five to ten micrometers a micrometer being a thousandth of a millimeter and the red blood cells themselves are about seven micrometers in diameter so sometimes they have to deform and squash to get through some of the smaller capillaries in the kidney and the brain particularly and the capillaries are about 0 0.2 to maybe 0 0.4 of a millimeter long two to 400 micrometers in length so we're on a very microscopic scale here now what's going on well the blood is going to be coming from the arteriole and it's going to be flowing through these capillary networks so there's blood flowing through these capillary networks round about the loops round about the capillary loops and we notice that the blood is going into the capillaries from the meta arteriole at this part this is the proximal part of the system the proximal part this bit lower down here is going to be the distal part proximal is closer distal is is more distant so the blood is going to be flowing through here and of course these capillaries are going to be in very close contact with the tissue cells of whatever tissue we are in could be a muscle tissue could be brain tissue but here's all the cells so the capillaries are in close contact with all the tissue cells because the only way the tissue cells are going to get oxygenated and the only way they're going to get a food supply and the only way they're going to get rid of the waste products is by exchange between the cells and the capillaries so there's a collection of these capillary beds as the blood goes through it's going to be progressively uh, deoxygenated so some blood is going to go straight through here other blood will go around the capillary loops now how much blood goes through the capillary loops is going to depend on the vasotone of the sphincters so if the sphincters the precapillary sphincters are relaxed they're dilated then more blood will get into the capillaries increasing the perfusion of the tissue there's going to be a vasodilation so if there's an increased metabolic demand Now what we mean by that is, let's suppose these are the capillaries in a muscle and if there's an increased metabolic demand, the muscle is exercising. That's going to increase its requirement for oxygen. That's going to increase its requirements for glucose and other fuel substrates. That's going to increase the amount of waste products that are produced. So we need to supply more blood to the metabolically active tissue and we need to remove more waste products. More glucose, more oxygen going to the muscle, carbon dioxide, nitrogen-based waste products perhaps leaving the, the muscle. So we need a bigger flow through of blood, therefore we'll get vasodilation, increasing the blood flow. But if we're not doing very much, if there's a reduced metabolic demand, if there's not as much going on, then we don't need as much blood going to that particular tissue. And there'll be a relative uh, vasoconstriction. There'll be a constriction of the precapillary sphincters, greatly reducing the flow of blood through that tissue. That means the blood will go from the arterial pretty well straight down to the venule without going through, without necessarily perfusing the capillaries. 
But this blood's going to be going through here anyway. And it's going to return at the distal part of the capillary bed. We always draw this as dark blue, or a bit black in this case, but normally draw it as dark blue. Um, because the blood is relatively deoxygenated. In practice, only 25% or so of the oxygen is given up to the tissues. So the blood returning to the venule is somewhat deoxygenated, but typically not very deoxygenated. That would depend on the workload. If the, if the muscle was working harder, it would be taking more of the, more of the oxygen out of the blood. And that's then going to return to the heart. So we've kind of got a, a 180, the blood's going down there, that way, that way, and then goes, goes back again. So supplied via the arterial system, drained by the venous system. So the vasomotor tone is, is absolutely essential. Now, actually, these, um, these cells will release substances such as nitrous oxide, which, uh, sorry, nitric oxide, nitric oxide and nitric oxide is sometimes described as a endothelium derived releasing factor which is a bit of a mouthful but what it means is the endothelial cells will release nitrous oxide sorry nitric oxide and this nitric oxide will relax the precapillary sphincters increasing blood flow other times, um, the vasotone can be controlled by the nervous system. So, for example, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system will tend to, well, it depends where it is, but it will tend to dilate the precapillary sphincters in muscles, but it will tend to constrict the precapillary sphincters in areas such as the, such as the skin. So there's a lot of control mechanisms here going on, but what it means is that the tissues are receiving the oxygen they require when they require it and they're getting rid of the waste products that they don't want when they need to get rid of those uh, waste products. So there's billions of capillaries. And maybe you can see that what we've got here basically is a large surface area for communication between the blood and the cells. So there's going to be a large surface area with the body cells. And the capillaries are the exchange vessels. So the things that the cells want, like the oxygen, that are going to go from the capillaries to the cells, there's going to be this exchange. And the things we don't want, like the carbon dioxide, are going to be going back. This is possible because the walls are so thin. In thicker vessels, like the larger arterioles, the walls are thicker because they contain this smooth muscle and the distances can be too great for exchange. So metabolic requirements are going to largely control the flow of blood. Also, in, for example, in the skin, if this was the surface of the skin we were talking about, it would be controlled by temperature. So when it's cold, there's going to be peripheral vasoconstriction reducing the blood supply, so the surface of the skin will go cold. When it's warm and we want the warm blood to go near the surface of the body to be cooled, it's going to, these vessels are going to vasodilate, increasing the blood flow. So what we've got here is a capillary bed. I've got loads of capillary beds. You have as well. If you look at your fingernails, see they're nice and pink. Now if you press on your fingernails, they go white. Try it on yourself. See that's gone white because the surface of the nail is pressing on those capillary beds. And then when I let go, the blood's coming back in, it's being reperfused. So a capillary bed, we normally say a capillary bed is fed by one met arterial. Here's the met arterial here. Supplying 10 to 100 capillaries. So that's a kind of a simplified capillary bed I've drawn there. So metabolically active tissues like the brain, the muscles, the kidneys, the liver will have lots of capillary beds. They'll be very well perfused. And when there's a metabolic demand, large amounts of blood can go to those tissues. 
Other tissues like adipose tissue and tendons and ligaments have less capillaries in them. So tendons and ligaments, for example, because they don't have a they don't have this, the capillaries that that's why they take so long to heal because healing is dependent on um, on blood supply and there's no capillaries in the cornea at the front of the eye because it's clear or, or the lens of the eye that's that's why it's uh, that's why it's clear because there's no blood going through it they're fed by tissue fluids so of course we have the interstitial spaces here between the cells and the capillaries containing the tissue fluid. The interstitial space. So this actually shows the um, way that body fluids are compartmentalized quite nicely as well, actually. We have the intravascular fluid, the interstitial fluid, then inside the cells, the intracellular fluid. But I think we can see the blood flow here. That's the main thing I wanted to get across in this uh, in this clip. Blood coming from the arterioles into the metarterial, going through this complicated, interconnected, tubular network of capillaries, draining into the vein, going back to the heart in the venous system. But this crucial exchange through the large surface area, which is facilitated by the capillary network, supplying all the tissues of the body with their nutrients and oxygen and taking the waste products away. In fact, really, the whole reason you've got a lungs and a heart is to get the blood here because it's looking after the tissues of the body. So the capillaries are actually the reason we have a heart, the reason we have the large arteries, the reason we have the large veins, the reason we have the lungs. It's all to get the nutrients and the oxygen and the requirements to these cells so they can carry out essential life-giving physiological processes, which is in fact uh, that which gives rise to life itself.